live soon. I wonder how long that'll be. Did we say we only want our cameras on when we're actually the ones presenting until the yeah, very end? That's right. That's what we'd recommend. All right, we are live. Excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Region 9 Tribal Programs and the FY24 budget. Well, it'll be more than just the FY24 budget. So I'm so glad that you are all here today. I am Cindy Smallwood, the Environmental Director for the Humul Indian Village of California. And I'd like to welcome you all here today. We plan on having a very robust discussion um, with all our wonderful um, division directors and program managers from the US EPA Region 9 office. Um, I am very privileged um, to be the environmental director for the Humboldt Indian Village of California. I'm in my office today, which is located on the Humboldt Indian Village of California Reservation, which is and has been Kumeyaay land since time immemorial. I'd like to have Lisa Gover introduce herself, please. Hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Gover. I'm the environmental director for the Campo Banda Mission Indians. And I go in and out. Sorry about that. The Campo Banda Mission Indians Environmental Protection Agency. I am the co-lead with, with Cindy on the budget work group, and I'm pleased to be uh, able to work with this distinguished panel. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I had forgotten to say that I was the budget co-lead <laughs> for, for the tribal side of the budget. I also want to acknowledge Raven um, Austin. She is the Region 9 comptroller, and she is um, the budget co-lead for the EPA side. Um, she can't be here today, but I do want to acknowledge her. She has been a great assistance in putting this um, roundtable together. Um, so I just want to let you know today you're all going to hear from US EPA Region 9 Division Directors and Managers um, from some very important programs um, about their programs concerning tribal uh, funding and budgets. Um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will do our best to get your questions answered in a timely fashion. Um, Remember that we are not able to unmute you. So the only way to communicate with us is through the chat. Um, the speakers um, will turn off their cameras when they're not um, doing their presentations. And also remember to um, mute yourself when you're not um, giving your presentations. So your cameras will be off and you will be muted. Um, so I wanted to ask if Laura Ebert would like to give a little um, short introduction also. Laura is our Acting Senior Advisor for Regional Administration. I Thank hope you. I gave you the right title for you, Laura, because everybody's exactly. moving around. What, ha what hat am I wearing this week? I am Laura yeah. Ebert. I'm the Senior Advisor for Regional Administration for EPA Region 9. It's my great pleasure to be sitting in the front office in support of Acting Regional Administrator Deborah Jordan. I'm coming to you from Martinez, California. This is the land of the Karkin Ohlone people, and I give great uh, and serious thanks every day as I walk my neighborhood. Uh, for this absolutely beautiful landscape, this place that people have lived on since time immemorial. Uh, working at EPA Region 9, uh, especially in support of our tribal programs, is uh, the joy of my life. I've been working in tribal environmental programs for over 20 years, first in Indian country and later for the EPA. I'm so pleased to be joined here today by so many of my EPA colleagues who I know believe just as passionately in the importance of tribal sovereignty and EPA's trust responsibility to tribes. One of the ways that we demonstrate our uh, commitment to supporting tribal uh, self-governance and tribal sovereignty is through the delivery of 
resources, financial resources and technical assistance to support tribes building environmental programs in the manner they find most appropriate. So I'm really glad to be talking here about budget with you and I'm so pleased to be joined by so many of my colleagues. Thank you, Laura. And I'd like to say that Laura and I did work together back in the day. The budget all those years out, ago. Oh my stars, we were so fresh faced. We were just children then. <laughs> Hey, excuse me, still fresh face. Still fresh face, exactly. What is our secret? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, thank you, Laura. I really appreciate your words. Um, first up this morning, we're going to, or this afternoon, boy, I'm still in the morning. Um, we're going to move to our first subject and our first speaker. And um, on the subject of what is a continuing resolution? Implications for FY22 funding and general status update. Carrie Drake, who is the director for Region 9 Mission Support Division. Hi, Carrie. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing very well. How are you? Can everybody Great. see me and hear me? Yes, I think so. And you are on. Thank you for being here. Can I add a, a document to the meeting? It might be helpful. Or is it just too late to do that? No, you can go ahead and ch um, hmm, if you it's just a document, not PowerPoint. It was a PowerPoint, but that's OK. I'll just talk yeah, about it. You can share your screen, Carrie, and actually because you're a speaker. Oh, I like that. <laughs> so let me just do that real quickly. Um, share my screen it's there. Share options, the screen. Can you see my screen? Nope, not yet. There it is, screen one. Actually, I want to share screen two and then share. And then I'm going to put the PowerPoint back over there. Can people see the PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, my goodness. I am so technically proficient. I'm really not. That's why I'm so amazed. Well, it is really good to be here today, and I'm the director of the Mission Support Division. Um, and Raven Austin, our comptroller, works in our division, and I'm so I'm glad I'm glad that you found her to be so helpful. She is brilliant, and we are very happy to have her. I just wanted to um, move down to the budget slides. Um, so, most of you have heard about the infrastructure bill, and plus the work that's going on the FY22 budget. And I'll get back to continuing resolution in a moment. Um, but I wanted to start with the fiscal year 2022 budget. So the Senate has passed it, the House has not, and the president hasn't signed it. But if the infrastructure bill does get past the House and the president signs it, there is a significant and once in a lifetime historic opportunity in EPA funding. Um, which is billions of dollars, potentially investments in drinking water, wastewater, geographic programs, Superfund brownfields, eliminating leads and pipes and clean school buses. So that's not what, what that's not a continuing resolutions that would be in the future. And then this is where the continuing resolution comes in that I'll talk about in a minute. But we also have the omnibus spending bill, which has been delayed until at least December 3rd, which is where the continuing resolution comes in. I'll come in in a moment. Um, if that bill is as we expect, we might see an increase in funding in our FY22 budget. Um, but that has to be enacted by Congress and signed by the president. Um, right now, we run out of government funding on December 3rd, which is what a continuing resolution is. And so really, the continuing resolution means that right now, until December 3rd, um, we basically have the very same exact budget that we had in FY21. <laughs> That's what it means. So um, because Congress has not passed a new budget, they haven't passed the FY22 um, omnibus spending bill. You probably know that the federal um, fiscal year runs from October 1st to September 30th. And so um, we're operating from October 1st through December 3rd on the exact same budget we had last year. But up above, we think more money's coming. Below, we think more money is coming. Uh, we don't have it yet. It's not in our control. And just to remind everybody what the budget cycle is, every fiscal year, every year, we're working on three budgets at once. This is FY22. This is this purple line is where we are today. 
um, we're executing a budget. Well, in the best possible scenario, we would actually be implementing the FY22 omnibus spending bill. No, that's not what we're doing. We're executing the continuing resolution budget, but that's the one that we would be executing. And then every, so we're beginning formulation, and this is important for, I think, for the talks from the other directors coming up and for everybody's understanding, we are already working on the fiscal year 23 budget. Um, we are thinking about what the president would want to submit to Congress. So by we, I mean EPA. Um, this is where people can start having input on what it might look like next year. It's too late for FY22, but that cake is kind of baked, except it hasn't been passed yet. The cake that could be baked uh, that we could add ingredients to is the FY23 budget or the FY24 budget, which is still just a, a glimmer in our eye. So those are the president's budgets, those orange things there that we will submit into the future. But right now, and I'll go ahead and stop sharing. I, I don't know if that's exactly what you wanted or needed to get the conversation started, but right now we are um, operating on the same exact budget that we had in fiscal year 21, and we'll be doing that through December 3rd. Um, we don't know really what the future holds, but we are hopeful and we are optimistic um, that we are going to have um, historic levels of funding to spend on um, on EPA's priorities. So I don't know, is that, uh, is that what was uh, requested of me? Gary, that was a great job. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to be, this is Lisa Gover. I'm going to be uh, um, helping to monitor the uh, the um, chat box. And I'm also, and you guys are going to love this, I'm also um, tasked with asking questions if nobody else has questions. So you know me, I'm always going to ask a bunch of questions. But here's my question to you, Carrie. You had mentioned that we have an exact budget as the one in FY21 from October 1st to December 3rd, because we're on a continuing resolution. My question is this, the exact budget for 2021 didn't get passed fully until, uh, what was it, December 29th of mm -hmm. 2020? So um, here's 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 the tricky part for me, Carrie. I can't tell what the exact budget for FY21 was. <laughs> So let me, uh, let Not me start funny. again. <laughs> I, I stay up nights thinking about it. I know, that. I know. Well, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I get where you're coming from. The, the budget that EBA had last year, I'm looking at these slides that Raven provided for me. Thank goodness. Because if Raven hadn't provided these, I'd probably be struggling with this. Um, let me share another slide. I'm going to just share a screen. So, oh, Carrie, we're, we're going to um, ask you for your slides as well. I'm not That's sure. Fine. How how we're supposed to share them, but maybe share them with uh, okay. uh, Shasta and, okay. and Cindy, and we'll figure yeah. out how to get them posted. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, so the federal budget last year in FY21, even though it started late, because what happened was they were using F, a continuing resolution for the first part of the year. And then, we, and then when we got the FY21 budget, as you said, a little bit like quite late, <laughs> uh, that was the budget that we had to spend. And so we had to you know, we had to make minor adjustments because the budget wasn't really that much different from FY20 to 21. Um, but the federal budget ended up being last year was 4.83 trillion. Um, a lot of that is mandatory programs um, that we can't have really much influence on as the executive branch. Um, and then a lot, some of it's discretionary spending, which are, of course were directed by Congress on how to spend it, but we have some discretion. Here's EPA's funding um, at the, at, <laughs> as part of the federal budget. And last year it was 9.2 billion um, in FY21. So that's currently the budget we're operating under is that same budget, 9.2 billion. And um, by the way, just so you know how much of that's discretionary, it's that little dot within. And by discretionary, it doesn't mean completely discretionary. It just means, um, you know, if we have competitive programs that we can give it to this person or that person, or if we, you know, it's, it's, but it still has to go for whatever purpose Congress intended it. So I hope that helps, but last, the fiscal year 21 budget was 9.2 billion. And that's the current budget that we're operating under. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. We're going to go on to our next speaker, Kerry. Uh, we, um, we'll send you some questions if we have, if we come up with some more. Alrighty. Thank you. And I, and again, I, I was hoping that was what was needed to get the conversation started. So 
Um, I'm going to have to step out from time to time because uh, um, my husband has a medical appointment that I need to attend with him virtually, but I'll be in and out. So um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Carrie. Really appreciate your um, the information that you gave. Um, next up, we have the uh, Tribal Intergovernmental and Policy Division. Jeremy, are you going to be speaking first? I will be. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for kicking us off, Carrie. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeremy Bauer. I'm currently serving as the Acting Deputy Director of the Tribal Intergovernmental and Policy Division. And I am presenting to you today from San Diego on unceded Kumeyaay lands. And uh, Alan, I'll invite to introduce himself in just a moment. Hey, Jeremy. Yes. I felt, I felt to say um, that I am very proud to honor that I'm, I'm currently living on Ohlone traditional land. And sorry that I forgot to, to mention that. So. Please, please go ahead. Sorry. I'm glad you did, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you for interrupting me. That's a great recognition. I appreciate that. So this title slide, uh, just really quickly, um, I want to say Ellen and I will provide some budget information on the environmental justice grants and also on the Indian Environmental General Assistance Program, or more commonly known as GAP. And then just a little bit of background before we dive in. Just because TIP division might not be intuitive to those of you who haven't worked with us. So just to quickly say what's in our program, uh, TIP, as I said, is the Tribal Intergovernmental and Policy Division. We're made up of uh, a head immediate office with Bridget Coyle and myself, while Laurel, Laura Edward is on detail. And out of the immediate office, we manage our environmental justice team, as well as our Pacific Islands team. And then the division also has three branches, the Environmental Review Branch, who review and comment on major federal actions with a focus on the environmental impacts, Mexico border branch who collaborate binationally to advance human health and the environment for communities in the border region. And of course, the tribal branch who administered GAP and also helped organize quarterly art talks in the annual conference. So um, the general recap of the FY22 budget process, I'm not gonna say much here, Carrie covered it. Uh, the only thing I will mention is that the presidential budget document for GAP, uh, the one that the White House proposed it had uh, for FY22, it proposed 80 million for GAP, which would be more than $10 million, million more of an increase than last year. So just remember though, we're still waiting for the actual budget from Congress, uh, but the presidential budget did propose uh, an increase there. So I'm going to pause here and um, invite Alan to talk about environmental justice and introduce himself. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alan Baycock. I'm one of the environmental justice coordinators here at EPA Region 9. I'm able to, to come to you from Paiohunaru, uh, the place of, of, my, uh, of, of my people, and uh, I'm glad to be able to, to be here and um, I'm very hopeful for the future for what, uh, for what we are able to do um, within, this, um, within this place. And with environmental justice, as you may be aware, um, it's a top priority for EPA, as well as the entire federal government. This slide really just showing the, 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 how, how many different things are, are being uh, pushed and, and, and uh, initiatives being, being driven uh, to, to be able to support environmental justice. Uh, really, President Biden set the stage early in his administration by providing executive orders directed at addressing EJ and including uh, one, three, Executive Order 13985 and Executive Order 14008. And then uh, in March, the American Rescue Plan was approved by Congress, and it included $100 million for EJ, with 50 million of it going to the Office of Environmental Justice, and then the other 50 million going to Office of Air and Radiation. Um, then in May, uh, came out the, the president's budget, which uh, laid out uh, a very aspirational budget specifically for environmental justice and being able to, to overcome environmental injustices and climate change. Uh, and it also included the establishment of the Office of Environmental Justice as uh, moving towards a national program with its own um, assistant administrator. Uh, currently, the Office of Environmental Justice is under the Office of Policy. 
Uh, there are other actions and, and connected initiatives resulting in EJ really being a top priority and a lot of new movement within the agency to support EJ in ways that really hasn't existed in times past. And understanding how all of this translates into funding into the future is 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 difficult because we're we're in we're in a place where we're to um, to move forward into into new uncharted territories. Uh, but what I would want to share is that we do have three competitive funding opportunities through uh, the Office of Environmental Justice for EJ work. And um, Jeremy, if you can go to the next slide there. Uh, so, so with those three competitive funding opportunities, um, they're called the EJ Small Grants, EJ Collaborative Problem Solving Cooperative Agreement, and then the State EJ Cooperative Agreement. Uh, because we haven't had a lot of funding in the past, uh, we haven't been able to provide these out every year. Um, and, and, and so uh, with the American Rescue Plan uh, funds coming in, uh, with the, the, the we have already had available for EJ grants, uh, we, we were able to, to do some, some things uniquely for, for this year. And, um, and that was to be able to increase uh, the, the, like the small grants went from 25,000 to 75,000. The CPS uh, went from 125 up to 200,000. And, and with the state EJ cooperative agreement, we, um, we, we didn't see an increase, but we were able to support more projects. And it is important to note that even with these increases and changes, that this was part, a lot of due to the American Rescue Plan uh, but it, that's really one-time funding, so so that's what we were able to to do with those funds, and and so what will happen next is is definitely a question. But here is what we know: um, on on Monday, the Senate Appropriations Committee submitted their recommendations for fiscal year 2020, or 2020, 2022. And there is still work to be done uh, for getting things approved for an omnibus spending bill, as Carrie Drake had shared earlier. However, um, what what was shared was that uh, you know resources will be paired with the agency wide expansion on environmental justice efforts from 12 million in funding to over 200 million, and that included 100 million for environmental justice grants. Um, on the slide lower, you'll see some ways uh, to, to consider how we could use these new funding opportunities into the future, um, including expanding grant authorities, um, new opportunities to partner with others, including with tribes, uh, working on actual infrastructure improvements within communities, and, and doing more collaboration with other grant programs. And if you wanna to move to the next slide, Jeremy. So when considering the future, it's important to understand that things, as, as I shared, are blurry because of this new ground uh, for, for environmental justice. But what, what, what can we see today? So uh, EPA developed a, a draft strategic plan and, and strategic plans get created every four years to be able to communicate EPA's vision and priorities and strategies in order to accomplish its mission. And the plan really serves as a framework for annual planning and budgeting and the development of grant work plans. So the draft is, is out now on the streets and, and tribes can be able to request consultation with EPA uh, or, or submit comments uh, now until November 12th. And it's important to, to think about this strategic plan and, and what is doing new. So, so one is that there's seven goals. And for the first time ever, goal number two is on um, taking decisive action to advance environmental justice and civil rights. And, and so this is the first time that EJ has had his own goal. And so we can look at that as goal two, but also we can look across because up higher, the principles, there, 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 were, there were three principles that helped uh, really inform the culture of EPA, follow the science, follow the law, and be transparent. But now we're adding a fourth principle in, which is advanced justice and equity. And so as, as you look at the goal, you also look across at the principles and know that, that these principles then hit on every, on every item within the EPA. So, so we're, we're not just like one location, one office in the agency, but everyone is working towards advancing environmental justice at EPA. 
And this does tie in nicely with the budget document that the Tribal Caucus shared earlier, because tribes also included EJ as a priority issue across uh, many different programs. And so what does this practically look like? Um, Jeremy, if you want to move to the next slide. Well, we, we can see through the American Rescue Plan, uh, just that, as an example, as an illustration, that we, we know 50 million was provided to Office of Environmental Justice, and it was meant to really help low-income communities and people of color that, that are facing the greatest risk from pollution and climate change, and really with an eye toward preventing adverse public health effects like greater susceptibility to COVID-19. Um, so OEJ recognized that it could provide um, grants or, or money through grants, but also looked at existing programs that would be able to benefit communities that are dealing with EJ concerns. And, and so didn't put all dollars within grants, but also among other programs. And, and so you can see, the, and these are national numbers, um, how, how these dollars ended up going to programs across the agency that are able to, to address and, and support uh, communities that are dealing with EJ concerns. And then Jeremy, the next slide, please. And, and this is just another way to, to be able to look at it, uh, where um, all, all, all the same things is just in percentage. And so you'll see that basically OEJ kept one third of the funding for being able to administer under, under grants and, and EJ screen uh, was, was another uh, opportunity that, that it used. Uh, but then, you know, other work was able to get done within water, within air, within uh, programs connected to land. Uh, to really support communities uh, that, that were you know, dealing with, with these concerns. And, and, and so I just wanted to share an illustration of how American Rescue Plan funding was distributed, because it could be a reflection of how things look into the near future, at least, as EJ continues to build internal capacity within EPA. Thanks, Jeremy. I'll, I'll pass it back to you. All right. Thanks, Ellen. So um, moving, moving to GAP, so most of you are probably familiar with GAP. Those who aren't, it's a grant program for federally recognized tribes. And through GAP, we provide funding to tribes for two main areas. One, environmental capacity building. In other words, funding to help tribes to build and establish capacity to manage environmental programs. And then second, uh, funding to help tribes implement solid and hazardous waste programs. And the team that manages GAP also provides direct technical assistance through webinars, calls, in-person visits, et cetera. So three main considerations for GAP. Uh, first, headquarters allocation. Headquarters, or more, more specifically, the American Indian Environmental Office, they're typically appropriated around $66 million each year. And then, um, as I mentioned before, the proposed presidential budget, the White House asked for 80 million, so that would be an increase if that is passed. And we will soon know the final number as soon uh, once con Congress passes and, and the president signs a budget. Um, and then just I want to make a general nod to recognize the work of the National Tribal Operations Committee and involvement, their involvement with discussions uh, and headquarters around budgets for future years. Uh, in terms of regional allocation, the driving function of the formula is $110,000 times the number of tribes in each region. And then any leftover money is distributed across the regions based on how many actual grantees there are. Uh, one note on allocation I want to briefly mention is that AIEO is currently evaluating whether to change that formula. It's not the topic of today's talk, but I, I, I did wanna recognize that Lisa Berrios was able to give, Lisa Berrios of the American Indian Environmental Office was able to give an overview at our talk on Monday. And there will be another national webinar on gap allocation consultation, October 27th from two to 3 p.m. Uh, tribes may request government to government consultation on that. And we can put that in the info in the chat after I present if you're interested. And then lastly, uh, with regard to individual grant funding decisions, we typically award around 115 grants per year in Region 9. Average award size is about 144,000, but the, the amount depends on the actual activities in the work plan, salaries of employees, fringe rates, IDC, any equipment, travel, et cetera. And our notification of funding availability that we publish each year goes into detail on how those decisions are made. So gap allocation trends, just quickly, um, I wanted to give a visual of what gap funding has looked like over the years. You can see it's been relatively stable. It did go up slightly between FY19 and FY20, and then again between FY20 and 21, um, $250,000 and $200,000 increase respectively. 
And we will provide updates on FY22 as we learn more. And then um, my last slide, this is just a generalized timeline of the gap year. I wanted to highlight just a few milestones starting with next month. Usually in November, we publish our notification of funding availability. Typically we require applications by January. In March, we usually receive our allocation from American Indian Environmental Office. Project officers, officers coordinate and collaborate with grantees over the spring and summer to finalize work plans and budgets. And in the summer, project officers submit internal paperwork to finalize and we issue new awards in October by October 1st to fund projects in the new year. And in a typical year, we might have 40 or so EPA tribal environmental plan updates. We might see 60 or so integrated solid waste management plans created, maybe 10 dump cleanup sites, maybe 40 waste collection events, 30 or so grantees working on developing their air quality programs, similar number working on water quality programs, and perhaps eight to 10 updated codes and ordinances among many other projects. So just want to say how continually impressed I and the team are by how much tribes are able to accomplish with these relatively modest gap grant awards. And that is all of uh, our slides for tip division. So I'll stop sharing and um, we can, if there's time for questions, we can take those. We're going to um, have, we have a couple of questions, Jeremy, but uh, first off, I want to uh, make sure that you can make your slides available to yep, us and to Miss Indian and to uh, Shasta so we can make sure everybody has, has a chance to look at them separately. I have a couple of questions that, um, that, that occurred to me, and that is uh, with the um, FY22 funds that will be coming up sometime in December, let's say, the, uh, um, that money, that's the money for GAP that gets allocated in FY23, is that correct? That's correct, yep, okay. that's correct. Good. And then I had a question for um, for uh, for for Alan about the EJ. I'm sorry. I'm trying to find. Um, I'm trying to find my notes. My second question was, how much uh, the EJ monies out of those pots is uh, set aside for tribal EJ projects, if any. Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. And I think that um, it, it, within the three um, competitive grant programs, there, there's not a, a tribal set aside. Okay, thank you. And then um, I, I, I had thought there was, Alan, and you didn't mention it. So I was like, what happened? Um, I, I, I make stuff up all the time. I, I apologize. Um, and then I there was a second question I wanted to ask you. Um, advancement of civil rights or the advancement advancement of justice and equity um uh i'm sorry i i'm not sh not clear on what kind of effort that's going to be and is it going to take money away from the ej funding pots um it, it it's all in, included within uh so so equity justice uh, maybe i'm not Maybe I'm not understanding the question. Okay, well, I and I know I'm kind of goofy sometimes. Um, you had mentioned that that the the advancement of civil rights is one of the EJ, uh, I guess, uh, principles, and uh, advancing justice and equity. I assume they were all kind of rolled up in the same thing. Uh, I apologize if I am totally out of sorts about that. But what I was thinking was. What is that supposed to mean? And will those principles, the the uh, the the um, adherence to those principles, cost money out from those other um, pots of funding that the grant funding that's available? Okay, so so I think um, well, one thing is is recognizing that that EPA as a whole will be working towards these advancements within the the, the principles. And then we have the goal two as well. So, so there's two separate things uh, that you had shared there. And so, so let's just look at the principle. So as you look at the principle of, um, uh, of equity, it, it's going to look, um, it, it's going to be included and embedded within the rest of the program. So, so if you look at, at water and how water will operate, it's going to think about and, and consider environmental justice one of those principles. So, so you'll see uh, funds, maybe not new funds, maybe they will be new funds, but but they will 
have a environmental justice uh, component. It's it's not just funding though that that this strategic plan is is looking at. It's it's a broad it's a broad vision. So so it's not just limited to funding. Thank you. Um, and and it looks like Sally's trying to help me here. Thank you, Sally. You're always a big help to me. Um, she says maybe more, maybe more what we're trying to get at, and and she may know me better than me. Maybe more about how does civil rights uh, connect to EJ? Great. This is uh, so so within the goal of, uh, of environmental justice and, and civil rights advancement. Uh, civil rights is really focused in on the external office. And so it's 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 the um, it's office of civil rights that are looking outside the agency to communities. And so if if there are communities um, that, for instance, uh, we'll say uh, transportation uh, ends up being being an issue that a community is is dealing with, then um, and and they're getting um, maybe a uh, a state agency is is being provided dollars. From EPA to be able to to do certain actions, but then they're they're not able to, um, or or they haven't looked at, or or maybe there's complaints from a community on civil rights that that the state isn't isn't doing civil rights uh, in in a manner that they feel is is able to protect uh, their communities. Uh, it, it's being able to bring that forward to the to the agency and, and a lot of the Civil rights issues end up being within communities that are that are both overburdened and, and vulnerable as well. Okay, thank you. I'm getting the gorilla arm from our fearless leader, so we'll go on to the next uh, presentation. Thank you all so very much. Sorry, we will have more time hopefully at the end. I'm keeping <laughs> my fingers crossed where we can ask more questions. Um, um, I just want to mention to everybody, to our um, participants, if you did not notice, this session actually goes till 2.50. Um, there will not be a break. We're going straight through. So hold on to your hats. Um, we are continuing on. Our next um, presenter is Jeff Scott with Land Chemicals and Rede Redevelopment Division. Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, Jeff is uh, the director for Region 9 Land Chemicals and Redevelopment Division. I don't know why I had to say that again, Jeff, but I I did. Saying it too. It's really long. <laughs> I just had to say it again. Okay, please go right ahead. Good to see you. Hey, great to see you and everybody else. Looks like we have a great crowd out there. Um, I just want to start out with again, yeah, I'm Jeff Scott, and uh, easier to say than Land Chemicals and Redevelopment Division. Um, I'm coming to you today from Washington, D.C., actually, and uh, I had to look up uh, what historic tribal land uh, this is, and it turns out that this is the land of the Anacostia, also the name of a river nearby. Um, and, and I will tell you, in spite of... Uh, the uh, changes that have occurred here and the moments and imperfections of this place, I, I, I do think it's a special place to be. And uh, for me, at least, it's a great reminder of uh, how proud <laughs> I am, actually, to be able to serve our country and work at the APA and work with all of you. And so uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thanks, Cindy and Lisa, for organizing things. Um, We've got like 10 different programs in our division, so I'm not gonna go over all of them. What I'm gonna try to do is focus a little on the, basically the programs that the tribes are likely to get money from and a little bit about the expectations for funding them in the out years. So uh, next slide, please. So um, these uh, are programs that are managed by the uh, Zero Waste Group, which is managed by Angela Sandoval, who I very much appreciate today because she is helping me uh, make these slides move forward so I don't screw it up. So thanks, Angela, for helping me with the slides. And um, let me, uh, what I'm going to try to do is, you know, just kind of give you the bottom lines of what you'd probably mostly be interested in, I think. 
So um, all of the programs listed here, there's four different uh, grant programs here, are competed nationally. They're part of national solicitations. Um, all of them uh, don't have particularly big pots compared with, say, some of the uh, larger programs like uh, water or what have you. But um, we, uh, I think, in Region 9 have done well relative to the other regions in getting money uh, to the tribes in Region 9 compared to other uh, regions. Um, so the first one is the uh, Tribal Hazardous Waste uh, Solicitation that's coming up, uh, as you can see in the chart, between uh, January and March. Um, it is a small uh, program, historically only $300,000 to be competed for nationally. Um, we've had a couple tribes in the past be successful. Um, you need to, it needs to be about hazardous waste though. And so there's limited number of hazardous waste facilities on tribal lands, but one can make the argument that uh, management of small generators of hazardous waste and household hazardous waste could uh, make for a uh, adequate application to try to get some of that funding. Uh, the second, um, area listed here are pollution prevention and I'll, I'll mix in the source reduction programs. Again, these are managed out of uh, Angela Sandoval's group, the zero waste group. Uh, many of you are familiar with. Um, they have national solicitations coming up in February and April. Again, the amount of money available is fairly modest. Uh, the uh, pollution prevention grants uh, the region gets 200,000 approximately, and that's to be in competition with states as well as tribes. So there's no set aside. The same is true with the source reduction grant program. The region gets 80,000 a year to be competed. So these are pretty tough ones to um, compete for money for. But um, a couple of years ago, uh, the Pala Band was successful in competing for one of those $200,000 uh, or $100,000 grants for the pollution prevention program. And they did a great job of working, basically focused on the businesses at the tribe on how to reduce hazardous waste, uh, save energy, save water, reduce chemical use, et cetera, and partnered with the California Green Business Program uh, to come up with uh, both inventory, the sites they have at um, the Pala, as well as develop some materials for other tribes to potentially use if they want to pursue something similar. So John Katz is the person that uh, works for our staff that um, is the contact in that area. The last one I mentioned in the zero waste uh, sphere is anaerobic digestion grants. Um, this is a brand new program, just got stood up a year ago. $2 million nationwide, um, competed nationally. If we got 10% or a 10th of it, it would be 200 K to us. Um, again, individual, uh, facilities, generally, uh, people that manage wastewater treatment plants, uh, put together the applications to, um, basically use food waste typically as part of a waste management scheme and take that food waste to the digesters at the sewage treatment plants to avoid waste and generate in, uh, energy. Uh, next slide. So looking ahead, there's a fairly dramatic set of proposals right now, whether you look at the Senate Infrastructure Jobs Act or um, the presidential budget requests uh, moving forward, that there will be finally potentially money for solid waste infrastructure for both states and tribes. Um, none of this has happened yet, and i um, not quite sure how it's going to happen when it happens, but um, it is very positive news. If you look at some of those numbers, uh, 55 million uh, per year, up to 55 million per year for solid waste infrastructure in the Senate Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Um, so there's a lot of potential for uh, 
new money here. And um, that money, of course, is badly needed by uh, tribes for traditional solid waste uh, management programs. And uh, at this point, it's not clear how that man money will be competed or managed. We're, we're not even clear yet from HQ if it was passed, whether uh, the money would be necessarily competed or whether each region could potentially get an allocation and have some more discretion about how the money was is uh, used. What I will say, however, is that uh, I've made a point multiple occasions to make sure that headquarters is uh, paying attention to the issue of providing some of this money for tribes and the needs of tribes in the solid, solid waste arena. And so I'm uh, guardedly optimistic that uh, in the next year or two, there will become some funds available for solid waste for the tribes, which is quite a change and, and, and truly great news. Uh, next slide. So the Brownfields program, uh, right now we are in the heart of the uh, competition period for Brownfields grants. The three, the top three uh, listed here, assessments grants to assess properties, cleanup grants to clean up properties, and grants for, oh, sorry, I have a scam likely, someone needs my money. Uh, since we're talking about money, uh, and then uh, re revolving loan fund grants. Um, so all of those are competed nationally. They come with a fair amount of money, um, and the uh, application period ends December 1st. Now, if you haven't already been working on uh, those applications, your chances of putting one together very quickly and being successful in what traditionally has been a, a very competitive process wouldn't be good. And my staff cannot help you put together an application during the uh, competition period. We can only help you before it starts and uh, after it closes to prepare for the next one. That being said, uh, there is a grantee out there called the Center for Creative Land Recycling. I'll say it again, the Center for Creative Land Recycling that uh, is funded to help potential grantees put together great grant applications. Um, any of our Brownfields folks can help you uh, access that group if you don't remember or want a little extra help, but in the uh, short run, we can't help you with the grant applications for those three areas. The fourth line here, tribal response grants. Uh, tribal response grants are basically uh, to fund tribal programs and state programs as well, but to, to help them with site inventory, uh, contamination assessment, uh, planning for cleanups uh, for the, their entire jurisdiction. Uh, we currently have about, I think it's 14 tribes that have tribal response grants currently. They typically range in the 60 to 80 K range. As is listed here in the second column, Jose Garcia is our contact for tribal response grants. So uh, if you have questions or want further follow-up, he would be the best person to talk to. Uh, the last category I've listed here in Brownfields are targeted Brownfields assessments. Uh, that program's managed by Lisa Nuziak, and um, she does a great job with this program. And this program is actually available year round. Um, and it's a program where uh, we have contractors that we uh, try to help uh, provide assessments and cleanup planning for tribes and other governments. It typically can be up to 100K. And so um, I definitely encourage people to look at that as an option for dealing with uh, abandoned properties or properties where the amount of contamination that's there is unclear. Uh, next slide, please, Angela. So looking ahead, this is one where I, I bet money, my own money, that there's going to be a large expansion of the amount of Brownfields money 
coming in the out years here. Uh, it's mentioned in the presidential budget request. It's in the Senate Infrastructure and Jobs Act. One way or another, I expect to see a substantial increase in Brownfields funding. And if you look at just one of those lines, uh, one and a half billion in Brownfields funding over five years to the tune of 300 million a year is what's in the Senate Infrastructure and Jobs Act at the moment. Um, so that is uh, great news about the expansion of uh, potential funds in outer in the out years to uh, help because the, the current um, programs that I mentioned for cleanup and assessments and revolving loan funds have been very competitive. We had a lot more applicants for funding than received money. And so this is going to be great news uh, moving ahead in terms of everybody having a better chance to get funding for their important Brownfields projects. It's also going to be challenging for our staff. We currently, last time I checked, we're at 17 Brownfields grants per staff person at the moment on my staff. So we're going to be scrambling to gear up for this potential funding uh, when it comes in. Uh, next slide. Pesticides. So um, the, the uh, let me start with the second line here, uh, technical assistance. Uh, basically, uh, the, the amount of money available in the pesticides program isn't that great. And so I'd like to emphasize that our team with Patty Tenbrook and our, our lead person for pesticides issue for tribes, Peter Early, are available to help you with your pesticides issues. And we've had multiple sessions at this conference, I understand, to go over uh, pesticide issues. Um, then let me move up to the uh, top bullet here, which is uh, the funding available for all states and tribes. So 24 million uh, sounds like a lot, but uh, when you split it between 50 states and all the tribes, there isn't a whole lot of money in the pesticides program. The way it's targeted in terms of states and tribes is it's targeted at standing up regulatory programs, uh, inspections and enforcement. So really it's geared to tribes with significant land mass, significant agriculture, a uh, significant population and or uh, pesticide manufacturers, sellers, or lots of farm workers, basically typically a fair amount of ag. Now we've done pretty well as a region in terms of uh, competing for money and getting money to tribes to the tune of about on average 800K a year. Um, but I'm in terms of the future, uh, at the moment, there aren't extensive proposals for more money, but I have been involved with discussions inside the agency, I will say, where we have uh, pushed, try to get more money in the pesticides of, program available for the existing tribes that, re that receive grants and the potential for new tribes to receive grants. So again, our, our contacts on pesticides are Peter Early and Patty Tenbrook. And I think that's it for me. Uh, thanks again, Lisa and Cindy. Uh, questions? Thanks, Jeff. We, um, you went over your time. Um, thanks, to Pat. So, Sorry. No, you knew you you knew you, I wouldn't ask questions if you went over. So I I get you, but I know I know your telephone number. So I'll call you if I get any. Thanks, um, Cindy. Who's next? Well, next up we have um, Matt Lakin, acting director for Region Nine Air and Radiation Division. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Lisa, for organizing, to both of you for organizing the session and for inviting me. Um, I'm going to ask Eddie Holman to um, share the slides. Um, it's a luxury to have someone else do the slides for me. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Matt Lakin, and um, I go by he, him pronouns. I'm here today living and working in the traditional land of the Chupkan tribe of the uh, Bay Miwok Indians. Um, I'm uh, appreciative of being here. Uh, I just want to also say that Elizabeth Adams is also here. Um, Elizabeth is technically the, still the director of the Air and Radiation Division, um, so I'm, I am the deputy director. Um, we are in a transition week, so she is representing Superfund today and, and I'm representing AIR, um, and I'll be the acting director for a few months. 
Um, so uh, let me get started. So the first, uh, Eddie, can I do the next slide, please? So, um, so certainly our division is, is um, you know, we support tribal air programs through um, our grant programs and through technical support. Um, uh, our direct source of funding are the Clean Air Act Sections 103 and 105 grants. Um, we currently award approximately $3 million to uh, 30 tribes. Um, that's, uh, for, those, for those who don't know this, that's about 25% of the total national pot for Clean Air Act Section 103 and 105. Um, that allocation is really determined by a number of factors nationally. Um, we contribute to those factors, but um, it, it is fairly, it's been fairly static. Um, really, the, our main barrier, um, you know, speaking to the questions for this section, our main barrier to bringing in new tribes to the allocation is really that that number has not been changed for many years. And, and I'll have a slide that addresses that question later on. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, we absolutely, oh, not yet, sorry, one second. Um, we absolutely agree that um, that Clean Air Act Section 103 and 105 funds are not adequate to meet all the air quality needs for our tribal uh, partner agencies. Um, and you know, one of the things we do is we do work closely with Region 9's GAP program to maybe mitigate some of that funding shortfall. Um, we are hopeful, you've been hearing um, from Carrie and others about potential for increased funding um, this year moving forward. We're obviously hopeful about the president's budget, proposed budget. Um, but, you know, um, just don't know yet exactly what that's going to um, mean for our tribal funding. Um, okay, sorry, Eddie, next slide now. So um, I wanted to point out a couple specific uh, air quality related programs that um, tribes are eligible for. Most people know these, but um, uh, the first is the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act. Uh, you know, this has been around for many years. There's uh, for any tribes that are interested in what we call DERA, Diesel Emission Reduction Act, there's a three o'clock session that um, we encourage people to attend. Three o'clock California time, sorry, which is an hour from now. Um, so since 2009, uh, EPA has awarded approximately $1.3 million in DERA grants to tribes in Region 9. Um, so uh, tribes have been successful at getting DERA awards. Um, we, uh, in this fiscal year, we do ex uh, anticipate awarding two additional tribal grants, but um, awards are not yet official, so we can't speak to that. Um, so there are a couple aspects to the DERA program. There is the uh, specific part of the program that's for tribal and insular areas, so, um, you know, meaning territories. So um, you can see the link there to um, that part of the program. Tribes are also eligible to apply for the DERA national program. Um, and that is offered every year as well. So um, there's the link for that. Um, it was, uh, I really appreciated the, the earlier mentions of the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, Alan actually um, presented uh, um, some information that I'd never seen before. So I actually learned, I'm, I'm gonna reference that here. Um, I actually didn't know. So that was great. Uh, thanks for your, Alan and Jeremy for your presentation on that. Um, so as Alan said, there was a hundred million set aside as part of the American Rescue Plan for environmental justice related work. Um, 50 million of that was for air monitoring related work. And that's the first two bullets here. So um, there's in the air monitoring um, area, um, there are, there's both a competitive grant program and a, a direct award program. So for the competitive program, we are very close to announcing a request for applications, RFA. Um, and so tribes are of course eligible to apply for that, uh, for that, you know, tw uh, for projects in that 20 million pot, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then the second thing there is, is we do have additional funds to support um, air agencies um, that are currently receiving funds for monitoring so we can bolster their efforts. Um, and uh, um, in some of you who are in that uh, situation, uh, potentially on this call, um, hopefully you've already gotten outreach uh, with respect to that pot of money. We've been reaching out to our, our tribal partners on that. Um, the last bullet is actually the one I learned about from seeing Alan's talk. So that is actually the $7 million is for electric school bus rebate. So that is when Alan said that there was 14% of the 50 million that he was talking about for DERA. This is what it is. It's this electric school bus rebate program. So this has been very successful over the years. It funds zero emission school buses in underserved communities. Um, and that does, of course, include federally recognized Indian tribal areas and, and um um, and tribal governments are uh, who are responsible for providing school bus transportation are eligible to apply. Um, the application period is currently open and it's due November 5th. Um, so next slide, please. 
So these last two slides, and I guess I didn't do Jeff's technique of talking long. I'm leaving plenty of time for questions um, or getting us caught back up either way. Um, so uh, these last two slides are just to answer questions that we got and, uh, and um, maybe get the conversation started on that. So um, you did hear um, from others on this point, but um, uh, we, we similarly, uh, we forward fund. So, um, so, you know, in the current fiscal year, we are actually using FY21 funds. So, you know, that is, has been our, been our level that it's been $3 million. Um, we don't know what is going to happen in FY22 yet. Uh, like I said, we're hopeful. Um, but to the extent that if we do get an increase, that will be used to forward fund uh, for FY23. So, um, so uh, just keep that in mind. I think most of you are, understand that situation. Um, let's see. Um, I think I already touched, yeah, I already answered the other questions that were on this. You know, we just um, can't really predict, um, but yet we are hopeful for some of the things that are in the president's budget. So this, it could increase. Um, next slide. Um, this Jeff also mentioned in terms of the infrastructure bill, um, these are enormous numbers, um, but, but I think for those who follow the news, um, this is heavily debated in terms of the final amount for the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, so, uh, um, in the infrastructure bill, if it, if, you know, one version of it passes, um, uh, there is actually $5 billion over five years for school buses. So it's two components. It's broken up into school bus electric vehicles and then it's clean school buses, which are more um, could there's other fuel types that uh, could be allowed. So um, we don't know yet, first of all, how much that program is going to be. So it's it's really speculative. Um, but also, um, you know, we're just working out internally how we might administer that program. So certainly there could be additional school bus rebates. Um, there could be direct funding for infrastructure, and uh, there could be um, a competitive grant program as well, of course. So, so um, you know, we're working that out. Um, we don't know, and I guess it really depends on it first has to pass Congress. So, um, so just putting that in, 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 in terms of looking to the future. Um, and then there was a question about climate change and specific funding related to climate change. So, you know, at this time, we're not aware of anything specific that um, that we could recommend or anything that's being considered. Um, you know, certainly um, programs under the American Rescue Plan um, and you know expanded DERA programs they do include zero emissions buses, um, which are um, you know appropriate and useful for climate as well. So, um, so with that, I will stop. Um, I think I'm well within my time. Um, if uh, um, Lisa, if you want to ask any questions or anyone else, I look forward to it. And I do have people on the line to help as well. Nice job, Matt. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And the forward funding uh, terminology is going to go into my repertoire. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, Sonia asked a question, when is the RFP for the ARPA going to be out? Um, and Eddie responded. Great. That it yeah. would be, should be sometime in the fall. Yeah, he's given that. That's what. That's all we can say at this point. I honestly, we're really close. Okay. That's about. That's about all I know. Okay, um, good. <laughs> well, I have a related question to that, um, uh, Matt. Uh, you mentioned uh, that there was a competitive grants to be released soon. That's. I'm assuming that's what we're talking about there. And was that the twenty million dollar pot? Yeah. So this is the. Um, yeah, this is the American Rescue Plan was focused on environmental justice in many different ways, but um, but specifically in the fifty million. Whoa, my computer. Sorry, I pushed a button on my computer. Um, hopefully you can still see me. Um, okay. So my um, the yeah the of the fifty million that were for air monitoring related, twenty million of it is for a competitive grant program. It's called okay. community monitoring grants, and that's that's what we're talking about, right? Okay. That's where we expect an RFA pretty soon. Okay, good. And then the thirty million uh, left of that fifty million is going to the direct grant. To um, not exactly. Um, it's close. Uh, t most of it is twenty-two point five is okay. going to million is going to the direct grant. For the rest of it, there's um, five million set aside for um, for EPA regions to put together a mobile monitoring platform so we can respond to, you know, certain needs of our state, local, and tribal partners. Um, that's going to be. That's going to. We're not exactly sure what that's going to look like. Um, we're going to probably share a monitoring platform with Region 10, so there'll be something on the West Coast, and and that could be just to deal with you know emergency situations or just you know special studies. Um, so that's five million, and then I think um, the other 2.5 million is for um, uh, administration-related things. 
Okay, good. And then um, I heard you say that uh, some of the tribes would be getting uh, some of the uh, air agency money bolstering funding. Is that uh, the tribes that have regulatory programs? Um, I'm wondering if someone, I, yes. So first of all, I think you're referring to the 22.5 million and we have been reaching out to all tribes that have monitoring to, to assess needs. And I think that's what we're referring to. Um, do we have anyone? Well, we, um, I don't know if I have anyone from our monitoring program on to answer that more specifically, um, or certainly Hi, Stephanie. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is, uh, Eddie Holman. I'm a project officer in air division. Um, mm -hmm. so I've been collaborating with our air monitoring office on this. Um, and so the point you brought up, Lisa, the direct award, the 22 and a half million pot, the primary focus of that was to upgrade PM 2.5 monitors of air agencies. Um, so that's the primary focus. So that's what, so those tribes that fell into that category, uh, those were the specific focus oh. along with state and local agencies. But the secondary priority is for other um, NACS, sorry, National Air, uh, yeah, ambient, air quality standard. Standard. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was the secondary focus. Um, so when uh, tribes were in state and locals were able to fill out the spreadsheet, um, they also put that in, but um, you know, we're transmitting that information to headquarters and uh, we haven't heard back about what awards are being awarded for the direct portion. So Lisa, I think the, I, I think um, one aspect of your question is, it, are we specifically targeting the four tribes in region nine that are doing regulatory monitoring or is it broader? And I think the answer is it's broader than those four tribes, though first and foremost, it was focused on particulate matter. Is that correct, Eddie? Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead, yeah. He's either back on mute or... Um, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry. No, that, that, yeah. that's fine. You answered my questions. Thank you, Eddie, for throwing in here. We're going to go on to the next session. Cindy. Okay. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> All right. So our next session is our water division and Tomas Torres um, the director of Region 9 Water Division is going to present for us. Hi, Tomas. Hello, Cindy. Thank you so well, much for being here. Of course. Thanks for inviting me and us. All right. So good Have afternoon, a good... everyone. I am Tomas Torres, director of the Water Division. Uh, thanks again, Cindy and Lisa, for enticing us to share the latest on our various funding mechanisms which I got to say, they're vast and at times overly complicated, but uh, I'll do my best to demystify how the water funding is allocated and distributed across the various regions and programs. So go easy on me. Um, but first, uh, I did want to take a brief moment to acknowledge that I am presenting today from the ancestral homelands of the Miwok, Yokut, Lisjan, and Muwekma Ohlone people who are the original inhabitants of what is today called Pleasant Hill in Contra Costa, California. Uh, as the guest of this land, I am grateful for the land and the opportunity to live here and to pay respects uh, by acknowledging the ancestors, the elders, and the relatives of these lands and by affirming their sovereign rights as the first peoples. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Danielle, in advance for helping me with the slideshow. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll be covering the, the funding allocation methodologies and funding amounts for the various Clean Water Act programs, the water infrastructure set-aside programs, and what we know about the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which uh, many of my colleagues have talked about briefly, uh, but with respect to the water allocations. Uh, and then hopefully at the end, we'll have a little bit of time for uh, some Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, a snapshot of the fiscal year 21 funding allocated to Region 9 tribes, uh, which included about $36 million uh, to tribes that have approved TAS for the various water programs. As you can see, about 60% of the funding is for infrastructure projects. And this year we were really happy to be able to leverage uh, a separate allocation from the border water infrastructure program, specifically for 
border tribal projects. Uh, and we haven't done this for about five to six years now. Uh, so we were happy to be able to do that. And part of the reason was that uh, the border water infrastructure funding amounts were uh, pretty much on a, on a lifeline of about $5 million to $10 million. So it was very, very small. But in the past year, we were able to get an increase in that. And um, I suggested to my team that we also carve out an allocation for tribes. So happy we were able to do that. The remaining 40% of the funding is for the Clean Water 106, 319 multi-purpose grants uh, and the Public Water System Supervision Program and Wetlands Programs. Um, and although the, the multi-purpose uh, funding is not a continuing program, uh, we will continue to award it if Congress uh, appropriates the money in the coming years. So we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So this slide uh, simply provides a two-year funding trend for each of the water programs over time. As you can see, the funding has been relatively flat over the past couple of years. The president's proposed budget for fiscal year 22 would make uh, modest increases to most of the programs. Uh, and the more notable increases would be in the infrastructure programs uh, with a 14% increase uh, to the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and about a 20% increase to the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. Uh, and of course, we won't know the final amounts until the final budget is passed. Next slide, please. So now I'll, I'm going to talk briefly about the three Clean Water Act programs, how the funding is allocated, and some of the national funding trend data that you might find interesting, although not surprising. Uh, first, uh, let me just say that many of the water program funding allocation formulas were established when the programs were stood up decades ago, uh, and, and they're seldom adjusted. Uh, there's a lot of politics around um, adjusting these formulas, a lot of pressures from different places, but and it's all really at headquarters where, where this happens. Uh, in the case of the Water Pollution Control Program, better known as the 106 program, the formula was last updated in 1998, and the current allocation is 12.2% of the national pot is for tribes. Uh, and the allocation to each region is then further parsed out according to the following factors. Uh, number one, uh, the number of tribes with TAS for the 106 program. And of those tribes, additional consideration is given based on tribal population, land area, and surface waters within those tribes. Uh, this results in a total allocation of about 65K per tribe on an annual basis. Uh, to manage their pollution control programs. Next slide, please. Uh, this, I, I wanted to put this slide, not so much because you don't know this, I think most of you know this, uh, but it provides you with a very challenging trend that you're very familiar with. For the past decade, while the number of eligible tribes to receive 106 funding continues to increase, which is a good thing, the annual appropriations for the program have essentially been flat for the past 10 years, uh, which is a very troubling trend. Next slide, please. For the <clears throat> Clean Water uh, Act 319, the non-point source program, uh, the annual uh, tribal funding allocation is 5% of the national pot of money or about 8 million whichever is greater. Uh, the allocation to each region is then further parsed out according to the following two funds. First is the base funding amount that each tribe receives based on land coverage area, 30K per year for tribes with a land area of 1,000 square miles or less, and $50,000 per year for tribes with more than that. I'll note that only five tribes in Region 9 receive the higher amount. The second pot is through a competitive process, which allocates about 2 to $3 million 
each year to fund on the ground implementation projects designed to achieve water quality improvements in priority watersheds. The maximum amount that a project can receive is about 100,000, uh, depending on the project scope. And these are typically ranked and rated by a team of regional and headquarters staff who make the funding recommendations uh, to the decision official. Next slide. Again, I wanted to give you the uh, unfortunate, um, you know, but very visual and challenging trend that uh, you're familiar with. And again, for the past decade, while the number of eligible tribes to receive 319 funding continues to increase, which is a good thing, the annual appropriations for the program have definitely decreased from the early days, uh, but have remained relatively flat for the past 10 years. Um, Next slide, please. I, I'm giving you these slides uh, partially to give you some data, you know, to give you some ammunition, but uh, we can talk about that at a separate discussion. The wetlands program, 100% uh, of the national appropriation is competed under two different requests for application competitions. First is a national tribes only competition that is run out of the Office of Water and headquarters which allocates about $3 million for a two-year cycle, and a second RFA that is run out of each regional office and open to tribes, but also includes states and local governments. And that pot is also about $3 million uh, for a two-year cycle. Um, I do want to note that the National Tribes Only RFA is a relatively new program and really was brought about largely due to the efforts and the advocacy of the NTOC and the R R9 RTOC. So a big kudos to the NTOC, the RTOC for the good outcome of your efforts. Uh, that's really notable and a really positive thing. And I hope we can do more with the other programs. Next slide, please. The following couple of slides speak to the drinking water and clean water infrastructure set aside formulas and what the funding allocations look like. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see, the tribal clean water and drinking water infrastructure allocation to each regional office is calculated as follows. Where, please bear with me. Some of this are, are pretty complicated. For the clean water set aside, the allocation is based on the percent of the total need in the Indian Health Service Sanitary Deficiency System, better known as the SDS list, which is administered by the four Indian Health Area offices here in Region 9, which are California, Phoenix, Navajo, and the Tucson uh, area offices that you might see there on the map. I think we have more than any region um, you know, managing a lot of these uh, grants for us. So even though EPA gets the money for the, the clean water set aside, we then enter into interagency agreements with the four IHS offices to fund the projects on the SDS list. The tribal drinking water allocation is a little bit more complicated uh, and includes a base amount of 2% of the national tribal allocation plus a percentage of the total need identified in the National Drinking Water Infrastructure Needs Survey, which is conducted every four to five years across the country to assess the 20-year capital investment needs of drinking water systems. Plus, it also accounts for a percent of the total need identified in the Indian Health Service SDS list. So, all of those uh, factors go into the allocation uh, for the drinking water set aside. Um, all of the drinking water infrastructure funding comes to Region 9 and is managed by EPA as opposed to the Indian Health Service. And then we issue a, a request for solicitation for proposals or projects uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and I think most of you um, get that piece. I think we, we currently have um, a solicitation open and I believe there's about a month left. It closes on November 19th, just for those of you who are still procrastinating. Get them in. All right, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> 
The national SRF uh, set aside allocation, uh, there's a lot packed into this slide. At the national level, the allocation formula for the clean water and drinking water tribal infrastructure set asides is currently set at 2% of the national SRF appropriation. Uh, however, there is a $30 million minimum floor uh, for the clean water uh, pot and a $20 million minimum floor for the drinking water uh, set aside. The big pie charts on the right are the national FY21 allocation for the clean water and drinking water SRFs at $1.6 billion and $1.1 billion respectively. And as you can see, between the two pies is the 2% tribal allocation amounts, which are $32.7 million for the clean water set aside and $22.5 million for the tribal drinking water set aside. Uh, this is the for fiscal year 21 again. Then if you go to the smaller pies to the right, the Region 9 allocation, which is based on the formulas that I just spoke about on the prior slide, amount to $12.1 million for Region 9 clean water projects and $7.1 million for Region 9 tribal drinking water projects. Um, uh, again, uh, the uh, drinking water solicitation is open and uh, my staff wanted to remind you that uh, you still have about a month left uh, to submit those. Next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to briefly share what is currently being considered in Congress with respect to the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is uh, pretty substantial. The bill would allocate about $11.7 billion with a B over a five-year period to fund projects under the Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Funds. That would mean that the tribal set-asides would be funded at about $234 million each or $47 million per year each. Uh, one interesting aspect of the bill that we were able to uh, study was that uh, it will fully fund the projects that are currently on the Indian Health Service SDS list, which is about a $3.5 billion uh, pot of money there. Uh, so that's a, an appropriation directly to the Indian Health Service uh, to fund those projects. So we highly recommend that tribes ensure that all of your infrastructure needs are on the IHS SDS list. Because, uh, you know, if this goes through, they are going to be funded. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition, to, uh, the bill creates four new programs, uh, water programs to fund various projects like lead service line replacements, emerging contaminant monitoring, grants to small and disadvantaged communities, and additional technical assistance support to drinking water and clean water uh, systems. Uh, we do expect that the tribal allocation for these programs will exist, but we do not know what those formulas are gonna be just yet until we see the, uh, well, first until the bill is passed and then we see the appropriations language, uh, which may or may not specify specific, uh, you know, uh, allocations. Um, so as you probably know, the Congress is still debating this bill and, you know, we are crossing our fingers, but we're not holding our breath. Uh, and so more to come on that. So next slide, please. Um, before I close, I do want to make a plug for the infrastructure funding forum that we are convening tomorrow at 10 a.m. So please come if you want to get more information or ask more specific questions and have them answered by very smart people, more than me. <laughs> so this concludes my uh, funding update. Uh, thanks. And uh, let's see if there's any questions. Thank you, Tomas. That was, um, I, I think I'm beginning to get this. I've only heard you talk about it, oh, I don't know, six times in the last year. But uh, I think I, I think I got a grip. Now, don't go changing it on me. But um, I, I have a quick comment slash question, and that is, when you say these pots remain relatively flat, especially over a 10-year period, you're talking really saying 
that they're going down. Am, am I correct? And and we can talk the cost of living and, and inflation in in those senses too. So staying relatively flat is a nice way to see the funding available is going down. Yeah, I- yeah. That, that's really what it is. When you factor in inflation and you know cost of living and everything, really the the charts, the bars are relatively flat, but in in real practice, they it really there should be a a trend line that factors in inflation and all of these other things that would essentially mean that you know there is less funding. Yeah, and so you, you are right. Would you be surprised uh, to know that? Uh, and and this is me calculating, so it's a it's it's an iffy um, it's iffy when I do math, but. Um, my analysis of the budgets since uh, 2010 have seen decreases of 18% in $21 since 2010. Would that is, is does that sound somewhere uh, near? It, right? it, it, it seems like that would make sense uh, if you're factoring in um, inflation and you know geographic cost of living and all of that. Probably so. Yeah, I, I, no. I, I have to admit I haven't done that calculation, but even just looking at the the appropriated amounts per year versus you know the uh, amount of tribes that are coming into the programs, I mean, just that in itself is a big uh, story. You know, that's pretty obvious and revealing. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't see any um, questions in the chat. There was a a comment, but that, I think that was for the the previous speaker. Um, so I guess what we'll do is head on to the next group. Tomas, thank you so much for all that you've and 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 uh, taking the time to educate me. And 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 I'm almost there. Um, and so I'm very happy. <laughs> so it's <hard> anytime. <laughs> thank you, sir. Okay. Great. Thank you, Tomas. That was awesome. Our next speaker is Damien Wilson. And Damien, um, I have your title as Communicate in Mind Program. If I'm incorrect, please feel free to. Um, give us your updated title. Um, and you will be speaking for the Superfund and Emergency Management Division. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, great. Well, uh, I just want to say thanks for this opportunity. Um, as you know, I um, Superfund did not participate in the uh, in the organization leading up to this meeting, so I'm sorry I don't have a, a presentation for you. Um, I'd be glad to offer that we could uh, follow up and do a more in-depth presentation about Superfund funding at, a, at an upcoming R talk. Uh, that being said, I'm just going to wing it here. You don't mind, and I'll just give a really a high level overview of, of our division and uh, do my best to answer any questions and, and pass them on um, after the session. So, we're super fun division. Uh, we are uh, in that um, super fund was established. Uh, with the establishment of the circular law, there was a super fund trust account that was set up that's in the billions of dollars. And so um, if you are one of the tribes that live in proximity to a, to a region on a super fund site, you probably know who you are. We have uh, about nine of those sites um, in the region. Um, if you um, are involved in the super fund process, uh, we have uh, cooperative agreements that uh, we're able to provide for tribes participating through that process. Um, we don't, to my knowledge, have any special pots of money that, that tribes can apply for, which I think is the intent of this session. Um, but uh, well, hopefully that, that, makes, that makes sense. 
Um, in addition to, to uh, Superfund sites, the division also um, has an emergency response function. And uh, so uh, we have a, a tribal liaison for emergency response. So if you are a tribe that uh, has something like an oil spill, um, has a, a mixed chemical site that needs further investigation, um, a mercury spill, lead cleanups, um, drum and cylinder cleanups, uh, or are impacted by a federally declared disaster. Uh, we have a Region 9 duty officer on site, and uh, we will send out a team to do a, a, a time critical action if there's an emergency. Uh, for for non emergencies, um, you can just call Amanda Pease. Um, you know, to discuss uh, how emergency response might might participate. So, uh, so no, like I said, I'm sorry I don't have a presentation. Are there any are there any questions I can I can try to help answer or uh, know, any prompts here? Yeah, yeah. I can prompt you, Damien. I know a little bit about Superfund, so I'm so I'm going to be very very dangerous. A little bit, a lot dangerous. Um, my question is this: You mentioned that the that that tribes are um, able to receive funding through a cooperative agreement with Region Nine. I'm assuming um, under uh, the, those tribes that are working or have um, resources that are threatened by uh, uh, national priorities list sites, particularly, but but other Superfund sites as well. Um, do they, how, how would a tribe that isn't receiving money to address those issues, how would they um, go about making an application? Do they start with talking with the Superfund section or should I give yeah. them Jeff Scott's number? So you, you would start out by reaching out to the remedial project manager for the site and, and, and begin those discussions with them. And how do you, how does a tribe uh, about requesting the kinds of funding that they might need to keep, uh, um, how do I say, to keep up with what's going on with the Superfund site that's uh, affecting their resources? I'm sorry. Any question? Can you repeat it? Well, because well, because a Superfund uh, cleanup or a Superfund site uh, takes a long time. We're talking, you know, somewhere between fifteen and and thirty five years to address ultimately uh, to final cleanup or final uh, remediation closed or whatever how, whatever the terminology is for EPA. So uh, a tribe that has a Superfund site near its lands that's affecting its resources um, it would need a certain amount of funding just to keep up with what's going on at the site, much less participate in uh, um, remedial investigations and the, and the uh, uh, choosing of the, um, the uh, uh, cleanup um, uh, strategy. How do you go about saying, okay, this is what we need? Is there a base funding? Is it uh, sixty-five thousand dollars a year? Is it twenty-five to have a contractor um, uh, work with the tribe, or, or how does that work? Well, that's a great question, and I wish I could uh, do a better job answering those specifics for you. Uh, I'll just say you should definitely reach out to the remedial project manager for the site. Um, I'll also say that you know. Uh, since uh, cleanups is uh, often uh, guided by the uh, settlement and enforcement agreements for the particular site, a lot of that is spelled out. Um, so it, it really depends on whether there's uh, an enforcement agreement in place and uh, you know a bunch of other factors. I don't think there's just a, a, a flat number. Yeah, I I. I, I get that. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess that's all I have. This, uh, can we have questions in the chat, please? I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm encouraging our participants to 
submit their questions because we have a little bit of time left. And we, um, if there aren't anything specific to Superfund, because I could go on and on about, uh, I could go on and on putting you on the spot, Damien, just because I don't know anything about how Region 9 is, is uh, providing funding for tribes and would like to know. And the reason I'd like to know is because uh, um, Cindy and I are responsible for putting a, um, the budget requests uh, budget recommendations, I mean, in for uh, Region 9 as a whole, as opposed to, you know, each tribe individually. So I've always been trying to figure out how to uh, um, put together a basic or a basis for funding for Superfund, working on Superfund sites in Region 9. Um, that's, that's me being, you know, um, how do I want to say picky, nosy, know a little, trying to, trying to make sure tribes get the funding they need? No, no, uh, I think that's great. And, I, you know, like I said, Superfund's a little late to this party. We're kind of crashing the party today. But uh, I'll just suggest that we we uh, touch base, you know, outside of this meeting and follow up. And uh, we can start participating in these discussions. Oh, great, great, Damien. I really, really, really appreciate it. And I know we're in flux now with the... Uh, with the um, with with a new administration and all, which brings me back to a question to Mr. Scott, since he's in D.C., you ain't thinking about leaving us, are you, Jeff? You're not talking to you're not you're not going to be a special advisor to somebody, are you, Jeff? You went dark, and he's not even going to answer me, huh? I I can assure you, no one here wants me, Lisa. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, I'm actually in DC because one of my best friends is retiring from EPA this week after 42 years of service. So wow. I, I flew out here to, uh, roast him. Okay. So, uh, that's, that's my, uh, commitment to Washington today. I will, I will allow it, Jeff. <laughs> Um, do we have any questions? I see no questions. Oh my gosh, Cindy, we we made a good uh, we made a good plan, and with 15 minutes left, 13 minutes left. Um, I think we should let people know that um, for super fun, en Enrique Manzanilla just retired, which was one of the reasons that um, super fun was late to the party. We were having. Um, transition um, going on with Superfund. And right now, Elizabeth Adams is the acting director for Superfund, and she had to leave early. Um, and so that's why everybody's kind of moved around right now. Um, every, everybody's kind of acting directors for every division. Um, so, but we didn't get to have a real going away for Enrique, which is kind of sad. He left right before the annual conference. And so just in case anybody knew or no, not knew, knows Enrique, he left early, so we didn't get to really celebrate him. And so just so you all know what went on with that whole situation. So we wish Enrique luck on his retirement. Yeah, we very much do. And then, um, I, I uh, happened to get a notice from EPA Region 9 that, um, the, that it, I, I'm not sure if it's Region 9 or if it's uh, EPA headquarters uh, looking for comments on the Carson River Mercury Mine site and uh, looking for tribal participation in that. So um, that's one of the reasons I was asking about how do you go about getting funding um, to try to answer the call to comment on uh, on a Superfund site, the only Superfund site in uh, Nevada. I guess it's probably the only national priorities list site uh, in in uh, Nevada that is um, that has some work getting ready to go on. So uh, those those tribes, the Carson River is a pretty um, big river and it goes through and touches lots of different other waterways and, and goes by Indian reservations as well. So I was thinking that it's uh, um, it was a good time to ask, how do you get, how do you get in on that game? That uh, announcement just recently came out like in the last 10 days or so, I think. And um, 
uh, and and I'm not sure, but but that's what raised my uh, um, hackles, if you will, about funding on on Superfund, thinking about those tribes in Nevada. Plus, at the same time, they're looking at the uh, uh, permitting of a of a another hard rock mine, um, the lithium mine that that uh, that um, Cliff and Mervin talk about. Uh, on the regular, that's uh, disconcerting for a lot of the tribes in the area that have some um, uh, specific and significant cultural and natural resources at risk um, in that uh, in that game. So um, I think unless I could go on for nine minutes, but I won't. Um, and I don't see any questions in the chat. So I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to answer all these questions and provide us with information that um, that that takes some getting used to um, and and knowing so my my uh, my audio sounds funny so I'm gonna quit Cindy all right so if there are no more questions at all I really thought there would be quite a few at the end here so um, I'm it's fine if you all want to leave a little bit early. Um, we've got 10 minutes still. So if you really don't have any burning questions, I do want to um, say how thankful I am for all of the presenters because we really did put them through quite a bit of work. Um, we did a lot of planning sessions and um, they, I, I do want to say I still am going to make them work because we do want their presentations so that we can upload them to the um, to the details for the session. You all can come back and get them there. Um, so we should have those um, by tomorrow, hopefully. Um, so I, I'm so grateful for their participation. And then I'm also grateful for all of you who have attended this session. Um, the budget work group is available to all of you to participate in and so if you anybody would like to join um, please feel free to contact us at any time lisa or i um, lisa if you can put your email in the chat and i will put my email in the chat and you feel free to contact us and um, be a part of the budget work group we will be working very diligently on the FY24 uh, tribal budget request for Region 9, uh, which will be presented to the um, regional administrator in March or April. So a lot of work will be coming up soon, um, and we would love to have you assist us with that. So um, if there's no more questions, or Lisa, if there's nothing I've missed, then I guess we will be done. Thank you.